Hello, everyone. Thanks for tuning in. This is Ingo Dachwitz. I'm a communications and media scholar and journalist from Berlin. I work as a reporter and editor for Netzpolitik.org, a German blog about technology, politics, and digital rights. It is my task today to give you a short introduction to the European approach to the personal data economy. And I think it's great to do this as an online conference, as much as I was looking forward to meeting you all in Jakarta. And now it's like a true digital discourse, uh, so to say, due to unforeseen events. I hope you're all well and healthy, and I'm looking forward to the discussion on uh, Saturday, May 2nd. Uh, okay, but now let's take a look at the regulation on the protection of natural persons with regard to the processing of personal data and on the free movement of such data. Very long or in short, the EU General Data Protection Regulation or even shorter, the GDPR. Uh, and I think it's a great time for this debate since we are heading towards the anniversary of this law but not as many might think the second birthday of GDPR. In fact, we have to look back at nearly 10 years, nearly a decade of history already, uh, GDPR, since it was in the making for approximately five years from 2011 until 2016. And then the law was adopted in May 2016 and was followed by a transition period of full two years. And in May 2018, GDPR really entered into force. And as I mentioned, I can only, um, uh, this will only be uh, a brief introduction. It can only be a brief introduction since the GDPR really is a law of super, superlatives, uh, really. It consists of 99 articles with hundreds of paragraphs and is accompanied by 173 recitals, so really big law. And the making of GDPR was framed as the EU's biggest lobbying battle by some. And even its strongest critics have to admit that the GDPR has set a standard for the regulation of personal data. That is a reference point for other regulation in other countries from India to the USA. Uh, so for the sake of this quick guide, I choose to boil, to boil down this big law to three concepts and categories that help understand it. It's the three R's of GDPR, how I call it, rights, rules, and risks. Okay, but before we take a closer look at those three concepts, we have to start with some general remarks. So first of all, what are the objectives of GDPR? Here, we have to mention two different aims. First of all, the protection of fundamental rights and freedoms of EU citizens. According to the EU Charter of Fundamental Rights, data protection is in itself a fundamental right for European citizens. In Article 8, it says, everyone has the right to the protection of personal data concerning him or her. But uh, data protection also is characterized as uh, a fundamental right that subsequently uh, protects other rights as well. You cannot freely develop your own opinion, personality, live your religious beliefs freely, or your, your political beliefs, if you have to be, if you have to suspect to be monitored at every time possible. Uh, but GDPR also has a second important objective. And this is an economic objective. Um, the law is an important piece of the EU's project to create a European uh, digital single market. This, this means one common sphere where digital services and goods and also data can circulate. To achieve those two goals, the GDPR had to replace an old data protection directive that was in place since 1995. So GDPR did not come from nothing. In fact, in some parts, it is not too different from this old directive from 1995. But this data protection directive had two major shortcomings. It was adopted very differently by each EU member state. So there was no harmonized law and no data single market for the European Union. And secondly, the directive was widely ignored because it didn't have, it didn't give the data protection authorities, the DPAs, the possibilities to enforce it properly with sanctions and fine. So we could see a huge enforcement gap on data protection, although there was laws in place already. Okay, so 
what does GDPR regulate? What's the scope? GDPR deals with the electronic processing of personal data that happens inside the EU or is happening to data subjects inside the EU. Data subjects is, is the name for, it's the wording of, of GDPR for individuals uh, which, which data is pros being processed. So this is one very crucial aspect. It doesn't matter where a company or any other data controller is registered. For if it's operate with personal data in the EU market, then it is bound to GDPR, at least as long this data is not anonymized. Whatever anonymization means here, I will come back to this later, is a question of ongoing debate. And the general rule of GDPR for this personal data is that it must not be processed unless there is a specific legal basis for it. So no processing of personal data unless there is a legal basis. The GDPR entails six legal grounds on which processing of personal data is legal. The most famous is the informed and freely given consent uh, of the data subject. There's a common misunderstanding that this was the only legal basis that is established by general data protection regulations so that whenever you want to do data processing, collect data, analyze data, work with personal data, you had to have the subjects really given and informed consent. But this is not true. Actually, there's six different legal bases that are laid down in the GDPR uh, on which data, um, data controllers um, can rely on. Other legal grounds are that there is a need for the that, that the data is needed for the performance of a contract or to comply with the legal obligation, or that it is needed to protect the vital interests of the data subject or for the performance of a task carried out in the public interest. And the sixth uh, legal basis is um, that is of very much high practical importance, um, that, this, that the controller has a so-called legitimate interest in the processing of this personal data and has come to the conclusion that his or her interest outweighs the individual's, the data subject's interest of data protection. Um, and as you can guess, we could spend another 30 minutes alone speaking about this interesting um, aspect um, that the data controller has to, has, has the right to, to, to act only on the legitimate interest and uh, his personal conclusion that uh, the legitimate interest of his business, for example, um, outweighs the individual's interest of data protection. But for the sake of the overview, we will just leave it here um, with a legal basis and jump um, to the first of our three R's, the rights of data subjects. As you can see, there's a long list of rights um, data subjects or individuals are granted by the general data protection regulation. And the first one, and maybe the most important, is the right to be informed. Um, so whenever there's data processing happening, uh, the data subjects ha have the right to be informed about it and not only have to be informed about um, the data processing that is happening, but what also happens to the data which rights um, uh, um, uh, an individual has concerning this data, uh, who's responsible for the data processing and so forth. Uh, closely related to this is the right to access. So data subjects, individuals have the right uh, to ask data processors, data controllers to access the data they have about them. And also closely related to this is the right to data portability. So data subjects don't only not only have the right to to know uh, to get to know what data data controllers have about them, but they can also ask them to hand out this data in a machine readable format. With this was um, this to, to to this article article twenty spawned the hope that. Um, this might lead to some form of um, yeah, competition among, for example, platforms. If it was possible for me to take all my data from Facebook, for example, and transfer it to another social media um, company, it might make it easier for me to leave Facebook behind. Although practic 
the practice shows that this doesn't work as easy. For example, if you don't have uh, any competition in the field of social media, there's no um, there's no social media platform that works in the same way. So I can I can ask for data portability, but there I, I have nowhere to go to. Okay, then in Article Six, team, there's the right to rectification. So if I stumble across um, mistakes in my data, for example, after I made a, I used my right to access the data, uh, I have a right um, for my data to be corrected. I have a right to erasure, which has become famous as the right to be forgotten. So I can ask data processors um, to to delete all my data, to forget all my data. Obviously, unless there's uh, they have to do this unless there's a reason uh, why they need to keep it. So um, I, you, you can't, for example, um, yeah, ask the telephone company to delete all your data because um, they needed, for example, some of that data um, for, for billing purposes. Um, then there's the right to restriction of processing and right to objects. So I can, I, I, me as a data subject, I can go to the data controller and ask them, to stop certain forms of processing, or I can object the processing in general. Um, so when I have given my consent, I can take it back later on. Um, and then there's uh, the very much interesting right not to be subject to a decision based solely on automated processing. Uh, what this means in practice, we don't know yet very much. I will come back to this later, um, but at least um, in the law, there is this right not to be subject to a decision based solely on automated data processing. And then maybe this is the most important uh, right. Every uh, EU citizen, um, every data subject has the right to lodge a complaint with the DPA, with the Data Protection Authority. So if I, uh, if a data controller, for example, um, doesn't comply with my rights, if, if they don't give um, proper proper access, for example, uh, or if, they, if, if I suspect that I don't delete or correct my data, if, although I have asked for that, I have the possibility to lodge a complaint with a data protection authority. Okay, let's come to the second R uh, of GDPR, the rules for data controllers. Um, well, the first one is, is, is an easy one, um, as I just said, data controllers have to act on the ground of legal basis as they are like laid down in Article 6. Um, then furthermore, there's key principles of data protection um, that um, data controllers have to comply with. For example, there's the purpose limitation uh, as a key principle or data minimization or transparency. So purpose limitation um, is one of the key, key really key principles um, that the data processor must not use data collected for one purpose. And maybe I granted my uh, permission for one purpose um, to any other reason basically, uh, or yeah. So that's the purpose limitation. Um, obviously data controllers have to comply with the rights of data subjects. And then there's an interesting formulation in Article 24 um, that um, data controllers have to implement appropriate technical and organizational measures of data protection. Um, so data protection under the uh, GDPR doesn't only mean being legally um, being legally compliant, but is understood as some sort of process. So if I'm a data controller and I want to um, con want to use person's data, I have to install appropriate technical and organizational methods, measures to take um, to take care that data protection um, requirements are met. For example, I have to limit the access in my company um, who who has the who has the access to the data, or I have to um, encrypt data so that not everybody. Um, can use it, for example. So there's a huge range of appropriate technical and organizational measures. Um, whatever this, uh, what what exactly this 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 formulation means is not laid out in in GDPR. Um, so there's huge debate about this. But the important aspect here is really um, under GDPR, uh, data data protection is not about only about um, yeah 
legal compliance, but is also about the technical and the organizational processes, the measurements that have been taken uh, in some sort of data protection management. Then there's a very interesting and new uh, innovative article 25 that um, asks um, data controllers um, for data protection by design and by default. So technical systems have to be uh, designed, technically designed uh, and pr process wise have to be designed in a manner um, that they that they have like data protection at their core um, and data protection by default means that whenever there's options uh, for data protection, um, they have to be at the most protective level from the beginning. So me as an individual, when I, when I log into a platform, when I make an account at a platform, for example, I don't have to go to the data protection uh, options to the menu, um, but I can rely on the fact that by default, uh, those options are at the highest level to protect my data. In practice, uh, we see uh, that this is not, not happening at all, and this is very hard to, um, um, yeah, to, to, to bring to life. Um, more on that later on. And then there's another um, very important um, uh, rule for the data controllers. They have to um, maintain records of processing activities. So they have to have a repository of all the personal data processing that is happening inside their, their operations. Um, um, for for doc reasons of documentations, they have to um, be able to show this to the data protection authorities, to the DPA um, in case. And, and also uh, data uh, controllers are obliged to um, secure the data processing's state of the art, as it is said. And um, last point here, um, in general, um, data controllers have to designate an internal data protection officer. Um, so this is a, this is a person um, that is in charge of, uh, well, looking at the internal processes of data protection uh, and has to kind of advise, like, like an internal advisor um, that's looking at the processes that are happening inside the company um, that, uh, that, um, that's, that gets educated on this, um, yeah. So there's a requirement for companies. Um, it's, it's, it's different um, from which size on, but, but many companies have to do it. Um, okay, and then now let's look at the last of the three R's, the topic of risk. Um, GDPR uh, entails a somewhat dynamic approach, um, the so-called risk-based approach to data protection. Um, for example, um, there's a definition of data categories, special data co categories that are so sensitive, um, high risk categories like health data, data that um, entails information about race, politics, religion, sexuality, biometric data, and so forth, um, that is stronger protected than general, um, than the rest of the data. Um, for example, by the fact that, that it is, um, that, uh, that, uh, that it is needed, um, that consent is needed here and uh, other uh, legal grounds um, do not work, for example. Um, then there's another um, aspect for risk, kind of dynamic aspect plays a role in um, the data protection regulation. Um, and that's the obligatory notification of data breaches to the data protection authorities and to the data subjects in case um, they mean high risk for them. And then very interesting aspect in Article 35 and 36, uh, data controllers are obliged to uh, do a data protection impact assessment before they start data processing. Um, so whenever I want to set up a new data um, database, a new data, um, data system, for example, or a system technology using data, I have to do a data protection impact assessment. Um, I'm, and this, uh, this, 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 this is a criteria for, for all the data uh, processing that is happening. Uh, in case you, um, the first step here is that you look uh, at the risk. Does my data, my plant data processing uh, 
mean a risk to the fundamental rights and freedom of the data subjects, then um, uh, if, I, if I expect a higher risk, then I have to do a proper obligatory uh, data protection impact assessment. Um, and if after this impact assessment, uh, I come to the conclusion that although I installed several organizational and te technical measures, um, I still come to a high risk uh, for the rights and freedoms of the data subjects. Uh, I have to uh, consult the data protection authority first. Um, so, yeah. So this is, um, yeah, one of the more uh, innovative aspects of general data protection regulation, since it is, um, yeah, making possible um, some sort of, yeah, more dynamic uh, um, look at data protection issues. Um, but there's a second dimension to the, to the risk aspect um, I want to uh, point out. And then we're already done with looking at the, at the law. Um, and we'll have a look at the practice. Um, so the second uh, dimension of this uh, risk of the third R, the risk aspect is that GDPR means an increased, highly increased risks for violators of that data protection uh, regulation. Uh, I said in the beginning that, um, uh, that the former data protection directive from 1995 um, was suffering an enforcement gap um, due to several reasons, uh, the GDPR kind of changes this game and increases the risk for violators to be uh, first to get detected due to the fact that the independent data protection authorities are better equipped now um, and to the fact that data subjects have the right to file complaints in every member state and also to be represented by NGOs in the field of data protection. So me as an individual, I can say, okay, I can be represented by an NGO uh, to, 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 to take care of my rights, to, to file complaints on my behalf. Um, and really uh, for me as, uh, if I'm on holidays, for example, or if I'm an expat living in another European country, um, now with GDPR, I don't have to wonder if I can uh, file a complaint here or I do have to do it in another country, maybe the country where the, where, where the data processor I suspect of doing, of wrongdoing um, has, is registers, registered or my home country, but I can do it in every member state actually. And there's no, not only an increased risk that data protection violations get detected, but there's also a uh, uh, an increased financial risk that is bound to those violations of GDPR since, um, yeah, uh, GDPR um, makes it possible for uh, data protection authorities um, to um, sanction fines of up to 20 million euros or 4% of the annual worldwide turnover of a company. Um, yeah whichever is higher. So this really is a game changer. This, this really makes, um, and we can see that already, uh, this really makes um, the um, data protection an issue um, that is um, in companies, for example, that is not only a compliance, but a financial issue. Uh, and uh, yeah, well, uh, please keep in mind, um, as I said, and I really want to stress this here, uh, this was only a very brief overview of some of the major articles and mechanisms of the general data protection regulation. Really for every aspect um, I mentioned, we could spend another 20 or 30 minutes uh, more discussing ex exceptions, for example, from those rules and how those art articles come to life in practical day to day data protection reality. Uh, and this is uh, why for the last minutes of this um, talk, I also want to take a look at GDPR in practice. Um, and the first <clears throat> thing to mention here is that although GDPR was aiming at fully harmonized data protection law for every, uh, yeah, for the whole European Union, we see some differences in the adoption uh, by different member states still. GDPR itself entails more than 60 opening clauses for member states. And even beyond those, some of the member states opted for their own interpretation of GDPR. So the overall picture I'd say is still coherent, 
but in details there are substantial differences between several countries. The country of Austria, for example, decided that the data protection authorities cannot fine public bodies such as ministries and governmental agencies. Uh, secondly, we can say that most of the fears that accompanied the days when GDPR entered into force, they did not materialize. Um, in May 2018, um, when shortly before the GDPR entered into force, there was a huge public debate and outcry about GDPR because, well, everyone who had a blog or website suddenly realized that now they had to deal with data protection as well. And in many cases, they kind of failed to fulfill the requirements before because they just had integrated, for example, um, Google Analytics without further thoughts of informing their website users about this. So we could see here that the European Union and especially uh, the member state governments failed to inform the public about what would be happening with the data protection regulations and um, foremost to give functional advice on how to get compliant. Um, in combination with the fear mongering that happened about the fines that would now be possible, uh, this led to a major backlash in the public opinion on data protection. Uh, since um, some little bloggers are, are also uh, kind of were felt the threat of 20 million uh, of fines of 20 million euros, for example. But since data protection authorities um, chose to use sanctions proportionately, uh, proportionately and did not start to fine bloggers with millions, um, the situation is quite, quite kind of quite calmed down. Um, but we still have to say in some parts of the public, especially among companies, um, GDPR is still unpopular and there's still ongoing debate and critique. Uh, the third aspect I want to mention here is that nearly four years after GDPR was resolved in May 2016, compliance is still a work in progress. And it's very much putting it gently here. Uh, I obviously don't have concrete numbers on this, but from what we hear from data protection authorities is um, that most data processes, um, when they investigate companies, um, they find at least some flaws in data protection. Uh, so in most cases so far, the DPAs are still not uh, are still very tolerant here and conservative uh, in finding companies and other data controllers, but this might change in the near future. Uh, fourth aspect uh, to mention of the practice here is that there are dozens and hundreds of lawsuits pending on how to interpret aspects of GDPR correctly. Uh, I guess there's not a single article and paragraph for which there are not different uh, readings. So the data protection authorities constantly release working papers and recommendations for orientation. But uh, we have to admit that it will take years until there is a legal certainty for the main questions around it, um, the GDPR. Um, yeah, but what we can say with certainty is um, that we see <clears throat> increased numbers of complaints to and decisions by the data protection authorities. So the DPAs are not very good in reporting those numbers um, uh, in a coherent manner. But for example, in the first year of GDPR, we saw uh, close uh, near, nearly 200,000 complaints by European citizens um, to data protection authorities. We also saw some major fines uh, for for violations. Um, for example, British Airways had to has to uh, yeah, has to pay a fine of 205 million euros for major for a major security breach, um, the biggest fine <clears throat> under GDPR so far. Uh, but dozens of the very interesting cases concerning GAFA, Google, Apple, Facebook, Microsoft, uh, Amazon, they're still open. So actually we wait uh, for um, for yeah for those interesting and bigger cases um, to be closed and to be decided up upon um, the only one i know of is that um, the french data protection authority fined google with 50 million euros in 2019 i think it was 19 for insufficient uh, insufficient user information um, but yeah there's yeah a whole lot of um, cases open at the um, data protection authorities concerning Google and Facebook mainly, but also the others of the big five. And then one last um, learning from the practice so far, uh, we can see that in the data economy, individual choice is often an illusion as I uh, already um, 
pointed uh, to in the beginning. Uh, if there's only one uh, social media company um, that kind of dictates um, the contracts and kind of dictates um, the um, the situation users uh, have to accept, um, it doesn't matter if I have the right to consent. If I want to take part, for example, in, in, in digital social life these days, I kind of have to consent um, to, 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 for example, um, the WhatsApp terms and conditions or Facebook terms and conditions or Instagram terms and conditions, which all belong to uh, the company Facebook. Uh, and maybe in the situation, in the Corona situation, now we see that we also see this. Many people might experience this. If you want to take part in video calls, for example, many people have to uh, have to don't don't actually. Although in the GDPR kind of grants them the choice, um, they they don't really have a choice um, to to choose uh, another operator, another infrastructure for video conferences, especially if their employer, for example decides to use one. I don't want to mention one here, don't want to open those debates, but, but just as an example. Okay, so this leads us um, to the open questions and to do what's, what's still to do with GDPR. And as you can see, the list is long and um, yeah, that's not, not everything. So we, we, we can still see there's an enforcement gap. So many data protection of authorities still lack um, the sufficient resources to kind of fulfill um, their duties correctly. Also, um, we can see that there's a pro problem with coherent decision making by oversight by the over oversight bodies across European borders. So, um, for every country, there still is one uh, data protection authority, uh, and they kind of cooperate. They kind of communicate with each other, and there's a mechanism under GDPR how they come to um, um, common conclusions. Um, but um, this is still very shaky, I'd say, and still. Yeah, yeah, there still has to be established a good way um, to come to coherent decision making among those different oversight bodies. Then we have to say there's no substantial progress um, made in the field of standardization and certification. Both the, this would be possible with the uh, general data protection regulations. And um, there was a big hope that, uh, for example, standardization would help to make data protection easier. Um, but there's close to no progress in this field yet. Also to be established yet is a competitive market for data protection friendly technologies and data protection management tools. So there was this huge hope that with GDPR, um, there would be established a market for data protection friendly technologies or data protection man tools, management tools that help you comply with data protection um, requirements. Um, but actually this didn't happen yet. Um, or not, not in a substantial way, at least. Uh, then, as I mentioned, there's many open questions on GDPR interpretation. One that I want to highlight here is the question where to draw the line between personal data and anonymized data. So um, this might be one of the most important questions um, also related to the question of standardization. So when do we call data that was further, uh, that, that was former personal data, uh, how can we anonymize it and, and, and in which state uh, do we accept it as anonymization since um, research shows that m much of the data, it's not enough to just, just to cut off um, some identifiers, much of the data that was uh, is so-called anonymized can be, can be re-identified by researchers. So next open question actually is thus the GDPR entails solutions for issues around big data, algorithmic decision making and data brokers. So far, um, we don't know yet. Um, the, um, the risk based approach might entail or might, might be uh, a possibility um, to resolve the issues around big data and algorithmic decision making because uh, if a data processor has to lay down and a data protection impact assessment has to lay down uh, the risks and what he, what he does to prevent the, the risks um, that, that come with the data processing he's planning. Um, this might be, yeah, a possibility to have a look in the black box that data protection, uh, that big data and algorithmic decision making, making um, yeah, kind of mean. But um, so far, yeah, still has, DGPR still has to deliver on this. 
Um, then there's a huge debate about innovative forms of data governance, for example, data trusts. So um, how, for example, can I as an individual decide to give up um, the rights for my data um, if I want to do that and uh, hand it over to um, to yeah a trusted body, a trustee, a data trustee um, that for me kind of um, could 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 deal uh, with uh, with platforms, for example. Um, well, then obviously that's a question how to tackle the dominance of GAFAM, Google, Apple, Facebook, Amazon, Microsoft. Beyond the questions of data protection, uh, we kind of see that uh, data protection is not enough to, to deal with those. Uh, there's a e privacy regulation pending, uh, a lex specialis that was supposed to uh, clarify GDPR on the protection of communications data. Um, um, this is Accord uh, due to extensive lobbying by the data industry, uh, still in the making, and there's no, uh, it's not seen, uh, there's no end in sight actually. And uh, well, just on a formal notice, um, the EU Commission is planning to um, to publish a GDPR evaluation report in 2020. Okay, and with this, I'm coming to the conclusion. Um, as you can see, GDPR is very much of a political compromise. Uh, as I said, there was huge lobbying going on. So, uh, and actually uh, both sides, data protection activists uh, and um, the data industry, they're both not fully, um, or not, maybe not at all, happy with the result of general data protection regulation, which, kind of shows that it is a compromise. Um, this means really, um, although it has the image of, of, um, of kind of, yeah, of Europe being the data protection stronghold or GDPR being some sort of data fortress, um, GDPR really does not prohibit the use of personal data in general, but kind of uh, establishes a regime of rules and rights and oversight uh, over per, uh, personal data. Um, yeah, having this said, GDPR is um, maybe best categorized, um, categorized as a liberal or neoliberal approach to the data economy. So uh, it has very little, actually no red lines inside. Everything would be possible, for example, if an individual would, uh, would, um, yeah, would give consent to it. Uh, very much emphasis on individual choice. And on the contrary, there's also uh, no positive vision in it, how to use personal data, for example, for the greater good, uh, for, for, for civil solidarity, for, for democracy. So uh, it's neither red lines nor, um, nor positive visions, uh, but yeah, well, very much of a liberal, neoliberal approach. Um, yeah, GDPR, I think that, was clear has not delivered what it promised yet uh, and it still needs and awaits proper adoption and enforcement so yeah my last point here is um, and with that I'm closing um, this uh, quick guide to the European approach to data protection regulation is that GDPR rather than a fixed solution for the personal data economy it has to be seen as a starting point really there's much work to be done concerning adoption and enforcement uh, and the questions of interpretation. Um, and yeah, from my perspective, um, it cannot take long until um, we have to accompany uh, uh, the GDPR with further specific laws like e-privacy law, for example, um, or we have to change and um, change certain aspects. Uh, GDPR is a good starting point for the debate um, compared with what we have in the rest of the world, I'd say. Um, but it's even, it is this, it's a starting point and um, the debate has to go on. Thanks for your attention so far. I'm looking very much forward uh, to hear more about uh, the Southeastern Asian um, and especially the Indonesian perspective on data protection. Um, and look very much forward to the debate. Yeah.